So welcome to another class about the brown spaces. And today we will talk about Cauchy's formula uh, in the upper half plane, but, but for bounded function, bounded type functions, and also uh, about uh, Poya class. And in this lecture, hopefully we'll finish uh, chapter one from the Brown's book, and then we move to uh, chapter two when we talk about Bader Venus spaces and finally define uh, uh, the brown spaces and then uh, um, understand some of this structure and et cetera. Then we will give some examples and so on. So today, the first result of today, we more or less already know, and I'm gonna prove it anyway, which is Cauchy's formula. And we know that Cauchy's formula um, works in the upper half plane. If we have a function, um, we just saw that in the previous class, if we have a function in um, the Hardy space in the upper half plane, then we have a Cauchy formula for that function. It turns out that we also have one, uh, if you have a function of bounded type with, a, with certain properties, okay? So let's see this. So let f be a function of bounded type in the upper half plane. And suppose it's continuous um, on the closure of the upper half plane. Okay, so we will assume um, two things. Actually, three things. So assume that uh, one f uh, has non-positive mean type. As we know, every function of bounded type comes with a mean type that uh, is given in either uh, Nivellina's factorization or either in the limit the new of f, and we saw two ways of computing this. Let me just write, I will always stick with this one. Is it model i? I forget, I think it's model. That's the mean type of the function. Whenever it's a bounded type, what I'm saying is non-positive, so this is less or equal to zero. Okay, that's the claim. This number could be anything. There is no condition of this number. Um, so uh, in general, what I'm saying, and here we're asking less or equal than zero. Uh, also that if you go to the real line, I'm asking the function to be LP so this is finite and P is the number less than infinity, greater than equal to one. And what else? Also oh, just two things. Then we have Cauchy's formula, which is This one. And this works for Z in the upper half plane. Okay. So if you uh, look at the real line as a counter integration, let's say in the, in the Riemann sphere, then uh, uh, you will cover your function. That's the, what the first statement is saying. But if you evaluate in a point in the lower half plane, you actually recover the identically zero function, okay? Um, yes, so that's Cauchy formula. So let's prove that. Um, so in the hardest space, uh, we saw this proof 
first for harmonic functions uh, and then uh, we extended this by to um, to all functions in hard space. Uh, so we first did for the real part and imaginary part. Um, and in there we use that epsilon trick. We would take a limit one epsilon. So we just uh, translate the function a little bit so that um, um, have a representation. In this case is not even needed because we have the function is continuous. So you don't need, even need that, uh, uh, um, that trick. Uh, but in here, um, I'm not assuming that it's in Hardy space, okay? So, um, so we have to work a little bit more. And for that, I will need problem 27. Okay, so let me recall what problem 27 is. So it's problem 27. Problem 27 says, um, you should write everything in green. Great, so little technical problem. Now we're back. So what problem 27 says, um, it says that if F is of bounded type and um, the moduli is continuous. Um, let's see, in the closure, then when you write its Levalina factorization, so a blash product, some exponential, and some e to the g where h is some real number and the real part of g is just the convolution of some measure against uh, the Poisson kernel, uh, then, uh, then uh, continues to c, c, continues to c, and f like this, then uh, the real part of g is actually less or equal than y over y pi integral from minus infinity to infinity of the log of f plus y squared dt. And equality, but well, it tells you other the conditions. Uh, let's say the equality. If uh, f of x is not uh, zero for all x real, um, and also it says that this thing on the right makes sense. It says that this thing is finite because if you put model line here then it is, will actually be less or equal in the measure sense as this measure here, which we know is finite. Okay, so that's problem um, 27. It actually it states uh, some other bits as well of information, but uh, the important one will be this one. Okay. So what we can do with that, uh, then in particular, if you take log of f of x plus i y, so the, the little f from um, the problem bounded type, non-positive uh, min type, then we know that it has a Nivellina factorization. So if you write it, it will be like this. G, but we know that all these other quantities here, this is less or equal to zero by assumption. This is also less or equal to zero because a brush product is always less or equal than one. So this is less or equal to the real part of G. And then by problem 27, this is less or equal than Y over pi the log of F. Okay. Uh, so great. So what you can do 
um, what you can do now is apply uh, Jensen's inequality. Okay. BBC, I don't know how to pronounce his name correctly. BBC Jensen. Is this a German name? Somebody knows? Maybe not. Uh, then then would imply what? That, uh, so what is the instance inequality? So if phi is uh, convex, then uh, phi of the integral of, of anything, let's say some measure, let me put a name for this measure, let's say sigma. It could be a, a real measure, it doesn't need to be a positive. It's less so you could than the integral. I hope it's better not to write this way. Let's say, uh, let's say f, let's say integrating some function. Let's say g, g is another name. Then this is less so you could than the integral phi of g. And uh, conversely, if phi is concave, then the inequality is reverse. Phi is concave. then the integral of phi of g is less or equal than this phi of the integral. Okay, so if you apply this to this uh, right hand side here, we have the integral of uh, a log, then I could put the log out. And uh, this is true as long as we have a probability measure. So I should point out that in all these things, we should have here a probability measure, okay? Otherwise it doesn't work. Otherwise it works, but you have to divide and multiply by the probability measure and apply it and so on. Anyway, we do have a probability measure here because this the integral of just this bit here is one, as we know. So therefore we can apply Jensen's inequality and we get that the log of f of x plus i y is less or equal than the log of y over pi integral of f of t, t minus x squared plus y squared dt. So then we can just eliminate the logs. So let me do that. Right? Okay, then we get that. Great, so why this thing is good? Because, first of all, th does this thing make sense? Well, F is by assumption LP, okay? So, uh, and this function here is LP, uh, LP prime, let's say, for any P prime, you put between one and infinity even, um, uh, as long as Y is positive. So, so this, this thing here is worth noticing, works even if, P was infinity. That is, if F was bounded, okay? Um, so, so, so far so good. And then what we do next? Well, then we define a function g, which we know we can do using the Poisson formula as this function here. So a function g, which is analytic in the half plane and where um, its real part equals this guy, which I always can do. A Poisson representation. Okay, so that would imply what? Uh, that would imply that uh, the real part of g minus uh, f, or plus or minus, anyway, will be greater or equal than what? Real part of g minus model i of f, definitely, and this is greater or equal than zero by definition, but by construction because I just defined the real part to be of G to be this bit here, okay? So therefore, 
I can um, write and both uh, and observe that by the continuity assumption, both the continuous up to the real line, either G and F. Okay, so I know that the real part of G plus or minus F by Poisson representation has to be some C plus or minus times Y. And since they're both continuous uh, on the real line, uh, we know what the measure should be. It should be exactly the, the real line value of whatever we put. And since we put exactly like this, that's what we're gonna get. Okay, then by construction, we know that C plus, uh, I think by problems two and three, we show that if we take the limit when Y goes to infinity of the real part of the function we did at I, Y and divide by Y, that should be this constant C in here. By, but by construction, the, the G part doesn't have this constant here, okay? So this should be, this limit exists by the problems two and three. So let me even put here problems. I mean, if the, I think it's two, three, and four. I would say two, three, and four. Um, this limit would exist, but the limit for G is zero, also by problems two, three, and four. So this would be just plus or minus this limit which exists. Okay, but C has to be positive. Recall that uh, the real part of G plus and minus F is always greater or equal than zero. So these two constants have to be positive. And you're just showing that they have to be uh, of opposite sign. They have to be the same constant and the other one has to be minus the, the, the guy. So the only possibility is that they're both zero. Okay. And then uh, you can do the same thing. So that would imply what? That would imply, so if I just do, let's say G plus F minus G minus F and divide by two, that would be just F. If I do this trick, then I would conclude that F of X plus over uh, plus i y is just y over pi. Similar to what we deduced, because we deduced that the Poisson representation always works in uh, the hardest space, even for p equals infinity, and this also works for p equals infinity works as well. Big, again, as we saw before. So we have that, great, uh, but we can do the same thing. So, so repeat, repeat the argument. Uh, for um, IF instead of uh, F. Okay. Uh, um, Oh, that, that's not what we get, sorry. Uh, this, is, this is too fast. There's a real part here, of course. Yeah, because, um, and uh, there was also a mistake here because this should be the real part. Yes, because the real part is represented by convolution with the, the real part of the function, the Poisson kernel. So I forgot the real part there, sorry. So we apart there, we apart there, and then we get this. Yes, this looks like we. Okay, and then we repeat the argument for if, then we got the real part of if, that would be the, the minus the imaginary part, let's say. So then you can add those representations. that the F is indeed represented by 
So it went a little bit too fast before, but now it's okay. Maybe I should move this thing to this. Okay. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Yes. Question. So here we take IF, and we also want to conclude that the real part is positive. But I mean, the real part of IF is like the imaginary part of F. Yes. And I don't think we know anything about the imaginary part, right? So why should it be bigger than why? Why should it be non-negative? Oh, so what I'm saying is, okay, good question. So what I'm saying is, first of all, I didn't say at any point that the real part of F was greater or equal than zero. F is just of bounded type. Yeah. I just, yes, I just want to conclude mm. that F is represented, the real part is represented by uh, a convolution with a Poisson kernel. And to do that, what I did was to, do, to use this trick that I know this oh, okay. equality here, okay? Yeah. Okay, so we know it for the sum. Yeah. Yeah. If I repeat the all, all the argument with an I here and then put an I here, then you will see that nothing would change except that you always had an I in this part here. An I here, an I there. And so you get an I here, an I there. So then you get the imaginary part. Okay. So the yeah. imaginary part is also the convolution with a Poisson kernel uh, of the imaginary part on the real line. So if you add both representations, then you get this. Great. Okay, so, oh, this IF looks like an if uh, for I times. Great, so, so, so then you have that, great. Then we use the same trick as we did before. What is this? This is just the same as, the Poisson kernel is the imaginary part of a certain function. And if you write what that function is, is exactly uh, uh, the Cauchy uh, kernel. Okay, and here is the part where p equals infinity doesn't work anymore. I can't write this, I can't separate this integral by this difference if p equals infinity, if f is just bounded, because then this function is not L1. Okay, that's the problem. So we have to eliminate p equals infinity. But if p is less than infinity, then this function here is definite L p prime, because p prime, the dual exponent of p will be always be greater than one. Okay, so it turns out that this side here is analytic because, well, because f is L and p and p is less than infinity. Okay, and so by the same reason, this part here is analytic in z bar. Okay, but then, but this guy here is analytic in z. This is in z and this is in z bar. So it can only be the case that this function is simultaneously analytic in Z bar and Z. The only function that is of this sort is constants. So this would imply that uh, this bit here okay, is a constant C. Okay, I want to show that this constant is uh, so C equals this, is zero. But then we see that model I of C is less, so you could only just apply some holder inequality. Let's see. So the, the LP norm on the real line, so let's see, explicit on the real line. And then I do the LP prime norm of this function here. That is holder's inequality on the real line. Okay, but that would be equivalent of doing the LP prime. Is this would be just, this would be this, like this. But if I do the LP, uh, oh, this should be supposed to be T. 
Un petit. Okay, so, um, so when you do the LP in T, this, you can just translate by X, so this guy will vanish. You can, so it's just the LP norm of that guy. So let me replace this thing here, which will be uh, just T squared plus Y squared square root L minus a half. And then you do the LP prime norm. Okay, uh, and then you can just do a scaling in this thing, just make a change of variables and say t equals uh, y times s, and then you will see that this thing is actually just y to one over p times some constant p. Okay, and p not p prime because the exponent we will appear will be a. Uh, um, P prime minus one divided by P prime, which is one over P. And some other constant that uh, would depend, let's say P prime. Okay, anyway, that's what you get. So then if you send Y to infinity, we conclude that C is zero. Okay. So similar to what we did before. So there we go. So then this guy is zero and this bit is zero. And this thing is equal to your function, and that thing is a proof. Okay. So, um, again, a very simple kind of argument, but uh, the crucial bit here is this inequality, uh, which comes from this bit, which is. Uh, the main part of problem 27. Okay. Um, let me see something before. Yeah, with problem 27 is already in the list of problems. So, so yes. And this is not a hard problem. And it looks like uh, maybe look like a hard one, but if I recall, it's not that hard. I mean, uh, the, the, the problems, you, uh, okay, maybe I'll comment about problem seven uh, later on, but uh, it wasn't a hard one, at least. It's just tricky. Okay, so now we go to another theorem. So before I state it, uh, so this will be a characterization of our functions in Poya class. But before I state it, let me just make some remarks before. Um, so, uh, so after this class, we will define uh, the next class. We will define a field of linear spaces and etc., and which which is a subclass of the Brown spaces. Then we define the Brown spaces, and uh, the Brown space basically. Basically, you have some function e which satisfies a certain inequality, which is this one. So that's called a Hermit Miller function, which I will define later, no worries. Okay. And uh, from a function like this, you can associate a certain Hubert space of entire functions associated with this function. Okay. Um, and the point is that uh, we want to know when uh, a function satisfies this. And sometimes we want to know, we want some extra properties. So a good class of functions to work with other Brown space is a function for some Poya class. So if you have E from Poya class, we know this inequality is satisfied with, with a lesser equal, okay? But there is a problem in the book that says that, well, if you put equal for some point, then it's not really interesting. So, uh, so basically functions in Poya class will satisfy the interested, interesting ones, will satisfy the strict inequality. So uh, taking a function, and also it has some nice properties because it, 
The other one would be that has no zeros in the upper half plane, which would be a requirement, and also it increasing in uh, vertical directions. So, so that's why we will need to know some bits about uh, Poya class. And so the next result um, will be about functions of Poya class, which uh, will be the defining functions for a, a De Bruijn space. So that, that's why it'd be important. And also there is some cool problems to solve just after this, this theorem, which I think is among the, the, the hardest ones in the book. Okay, so theorem 14. I think I put the number in the other one. Yes. Okay, so let E have no zeros. Let's say it's an elliptic entire. That is analytic in the whole complex plane. and have no zeros in the upper half plane, okay? Which one uh, condition to being Poya class. Assume the second condition to be of Poya class. For all Z, okay. So we need to check if the function has a non-decreasing uh, invert is non is uh, non-decreasing vertical lines going from the real line up in inside the, the upper half plane, and it turns out that this is equivalent to another one. Uh, then, which sometimes it is easier to test. Then E belongs to Poya class if and only if the real part of I log of E of Z divided by Z is greater than or equal to zero. For Z in the upper half plane. I should say something else. I should say, move this a bit. will normalize the function to be one at the origin, okay? So the way I'm defining the log, I can define the log in the upper half plane because E has no zeros there, so I can define the log. And since E has no zeros here at the origin, I can even define the log as like um, integral of E prime over E from zero to Z, for instance. So that way I'll be defining the log of z such that when you evaluate at the origin, it's zero because e at the origin would be one and the log of one is zero. Okay. So we just need to check that uh, the non-decreasing property is equivalent to this to this thing here. Okay, so how can we prove that? So let me prove uh, that the condition is uh, sufficient. Uh, no, it's, um, it's necessary, yes. Okay, so how can we prove that necessity? So suppose, um, suppose, E is of Poya class, then we have to show that this condition, I mean, maybe give a name here, star. Then we have to show that the star condition holds. How can we do that? Well, if it's for Poya class, we know by problem 13, that there exists a sequence of polynomials, P, polynomials, uh, and also of Poya class. That means it's just a polynomial that has no zeros in the upper half plane. 
such that Pn converges to E, you know, we write it like this to mean uniform topology, meaning uh, uniform topology uh, in compact sets. Okay, so it converges uniformly, uniformly in compact sets. And since E of zero is one, we can assume Pn of zero is one because Pn of zero will be uh, for n sufficiently large would not be zero and be close to one. So you can just normalize and divide by the value at the origin. That would be okay. And it would still be converging to E. Okay. So let's say Pn of z is something like one minus z over w1 bar, one minus z over w r bar, okay? So if I show, um, so these are all polynomials of polyol class. So if I show that this condition is satisfied for each polynomial, okay? In the limit, this condition will still be satisfied because they will converge pointwise. And then I will show that this condition holds, so therefore it's necessary, okay? But since we're taking logs here, and log of a product would be the sum of the logs. So if I show just for one term, then uh, that this condition holds, then for a product of terms like this, this condition will hold as well, because sum of things, uh, positive things is positive, okay? So, um, so we just need to show oh and these wj's here are points in the upper half plane so w bar is in the lower half plane um uh, uh closure because it can have real zeros um Yes, uh, we just need to show star each term. Okay, so let's, for instance, let uh, W1 be, let's say, some whole E2 uh, has to be in the upper half plane, so only phi. I say equal in few, I say equal in pi. Okay. So we have to uh, prove that this thing is um, um, satisfied condition star. So what we do is, uh, is the following. We just take the condition star we have, which is one minus z over w one bar divided by z. And we're differentiating the whole, okay? So if, if, if you look this guy, when the whole goes to infinity, okay, so this would be some log and you divided by the whole. So when whole, uh, oops. oh, sorry, this would be some log with something here. And this guy here depends on whole. So if, if, if this variable here goes to infinity, this bit goes to zero and you're taking log of one, which is zero. Okay, so therefore this, this stuff here goes to zero when whole goes to infinity. So if I prove it's decreasing, so if I prove this thing is less or equal than zero, then it's decreasing to zero. So therefore it's always positive. Okay, so this is always a nice way to show that something's always greater or equal than zero. We show it vanishes at infinity, but it decreases as it goes to infinity. So the thing has to be greater or equal than zero. Okay. And this is a simple computation. Um, this would be what? If we differentiate, um, this would be just the real part. You can just move this derivative to the inside. And if we differentiate, we get what? The z will stay, so we have i over z over one minus z over w one bar. And then you have to differentiate 
W1 bar and if you differentiate you just get in it's in some whole squared A2 pi. Oh, it has to be bar S to minus V. Okay, and this was I didn't write it explicitly. Uh, yeah, so I'm just differentiating the log, okay? So then it's just, just a simple computation to do. You can cancel, you can cancel um, this guy with that guy there. And then you can do the computation. Um, and this is minus sine of phi plus uh, y over rho divided by um, rho e to i phi minus c squared. Okay. So you have to, again, you have to multiply by the conjugate of the uh, denominator here above and below to take the real part, etc. You do that and you see that you get this and this is less or equal than zero. Okay, as claimed, so, so therefore it's positive because at infinity, this thing here is converging to zero. Okay. Um, Oh, did I stop something? Oh, I did. I don't know why. Okay, we're back now. Okay, uh, so this proves uh, necessity. So let me prove uh, sufficiency. How can I write sufficiency? I don't know. Let me write it like this. Okay. Um, do we need to prove something else? No, it's just that. Okay, so assume now. And by the way, any questions in the previous proof in the necessity part? Great. So this will be another one of these proofs that we're just trying to, first we characterize the ones which have no zeros. And then if he has a zero, we we'll remove it and then prove that well, once we move it, we have the exact same condition, then you can remove it once more and so on. And in the limit, you get something with no zeros that satisfies the same condition. And that, so this uh, was the, the, the base case, let's say, and then finish. Okay. Um, I think you're still muted. It's now okay? Yeah, now it works again. Great. I don't know why my internet is shutting down. I don't think it's the internet. I think my computer is stopping the internet for some reason. Okay, so let me um, prove that. Maybe I can finish this proof uh, before the internet shuts down again. Okay, so um, what do we have to do? Well, we know this thing is greater equal than zero, so we can apply Poisson's representation. That's the step one. So, okay. Has to be some ay plus y over zero, the prime and infinity to infinity the mu of t, t minus x squared plus y squared. Great, okay? But we do know what this function is because if you look, um, this guy here will be well-defined as long as, on the real line, as long as uh, it's not a zero of the function e, okay? So if I define, so let's, phi of t be just the real part of i 
log of E of C, okay, which is the same to say that um, E to I phi of T is the function E T bar over E T on the real line. This function has model I one, so it could write it like this, okay. Or maybe there is a two somewhere. Yes, there is a two right here. Um, divided by two. Yes. Okay. So if I do that, what we know about Poisson representation is that if I integrate from A to B, the mu t, this will be the limit when y goes to zero of the integral from A to B of the real part of the function that I'm representing. Uh, in T. Okay, but uh, this will be just the integral from A to B. I could just put Y equals zero here and that will be exactly just phi of t divided by t dt. And this will hold if e of x is different than zero for all x between a and b, okay? In particular, you can include, and note that this function phi of t is well-defined as long as, uh, oh, I should say t here, this is on the real line as long as uh, E of T is not zero. So maybe I should even say this thing here. Okay. So this is well-defined as long as E of, it's not a real zero of E. So then by Poisson representation, you have this. So therefore your measure is actually this guy. Okay. And particularly just show that this thing is uh, uh, greater or equal than zero. Okay, there will be another way of showing this that we will do later that we will show that uh, actually phi prime is greater or equal than zero whenever it's defined Okay, and that the origin is well defined in the neighborhood of the origin, it's vanishing at the origin. So therefore it's negative for X negative and positive for uh, X positive, phi of T, for T positive and T negative. So if you divide by T, that's why when you divide by T, we get something greater or equal than zero. But we will do that only later. Okay, so far this just comes from Poisson representation because you know that mu has to be uh, positive or no negative. Okay. So, so let me deal with the case that E has no zeros. Well, if E has no zeros, then I can definitely define this function here. Okay. We know, so E star, always recall that E star, the star notation is always taking double bar, 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 okay? We know by uh, the condition that this is less or equal to one, we're seeing the upper half plane. So therefore it's bounded, so bounded type. So we have a nivellinian factorization, but if it has no zeros, then the Lasky product goes away, okay? We also know, well, let me maybe define. So FC of E, let me erase this. Uh, um, has uh, an Evalina. Uh, factorization. Recall that the condition for Nevalina's factorization is that zero is not an accumulation point 
the origin is not an accumulation point of the zeros, but f of zero is one, which uh, satisfies the condition. So f is just, and it has no zeros by assumption, because I'm assuming E has no zeros. So it's just this thing. Okay. And then by problem 27, uh, twenty-seven. Uh, we know that. Well, the real part. Well, the real part of G has to be greater than or equal than zero because F is less than or equal than one. Okay. So, uh, so in principle, so we know that the real part of G is just what a measure involved with the Poisson kernel, okay? But since F is less than or equal than one, when you go to the real line, you should recover the measure. And then we would conclude that, uh, but, it, but the model I of F being less than or equal than one uh, implies that, uh, well, maybe I should put the minus here, implies that the real part of G is greater or equal than zero. Okay, uh, the measure is greater or equal than zero. Okay, because F, is so less equal than one, we imply the measure is positive, and that would imply that the measure, the real part of G is greater or equal than zero. Okay. Um, now I have to take a look at problem 27. Just make sure. Um, yes, great. So by, so let me see how he writes the real one. So maybe I should, uh, Yeah, I, got, I don't think it's going to be a problem, but let's continue. Okay, so by problem 27, what I want to do is here, I want to show that G is identically zero. That's the, the idea. So how can I show this using problem 27? Problem 27 will say that, um, the real part of G Let me see how, maybe I have a mistake here. Let's see. Um, um, Oh yes, it's it's even worse than this. When we go to the real line, yes, yes, we have more. Yes, I think we have more. Yes. So we do know that this is the Levadinus factorization for G. Okay, so and G. Let me write it explicitly, so I don't have any problems. These arguments in this book, I mean. I mean, I think you already, you already figure out by this point. They're very sharp. You have to follow a very uh, strict sequence of steps. Otherwise, uh, if you try to do something different, et cetera, then you may hit a wall and then you have to go back and do exactly the original argument. So, so that's, that's why sometimes you can get uh, uh, confused. So this would be a measure. Okay, so we do know that, okay. But we do know that F on the real line has moduli one, okay. So that implies that G, this mu have to be zero. It's more than that since F of X, we don't need to use problem 27. 
is moduli one for every x on the real line. It has no zeros. It okay, continues up to the real line. Okay, that would imply by problem 27. Actually, we have to use problem 27, but the equality part that the real part of G that mu, now we got it, that mu is actually just the log of f of x, uh, sorry, f of t dt, but that's identical to zero. Okay, so let me go back to problem 27 here. Yes, so we're using this equality part. Equality if f has no zeros on the real line. Okay, so uh, so that's why. So we have equality here, but this bit is zero because f is equal to one on the real line. Okay. Okay. What else? So g is zero. So f. It's just an exponential. And then I will leave you to, then it's easy. Then it is easy to show. Oh, again, in more over H here, H has to be uh, less or equal than zero. Because F has um, model I less or equal than one in the upper half plane. And now that we know that g is zero, this is gonna be h times y in the upper half plane. So therefore h has to be less or equal than zero. Okay, so with this information, then it's easy to show um, that, um, so f has to be just an exponential. That means e star of e is just an exponential. And then you can uh, easily figure out that um, yeah you also know you have to use the condition that you also you also know that the real part of i log of e of z over z is greater or equal than zero okay but you know now that e star over e is just an explanation etc that uh, E Z is just E to minus A Z squared plus some uh, I uh, P Z with um, the imaginary part of P. That's equal to zero, I think. Let me take a look. Um, nice. Me just want to write exactly as in the result. Yes. Okay. So then you figure out that it just, it just has exactly the same form as a function in point class. The exponential bit, and if we go to theorem on uh, theorem seven, then there is a, a factorization for functions of point class. There is the exponential bit and there is the other bit of the product of zeros and the exponential bit is exactly like this. So this is a function of point class. Okay, so if it has no zeros, great. Um, basically, uh, it's just a Poisson factorization. Uh, it basically, it's just never needle factorization in problem 27. Okay, suppose it has a zero. Okay, suppose it has a zero. Then uh, let's say write E1 of Z 
you cut that zero. You say divided by one minus that goes back to one bar. Okay, so you cut that zero. So then in particular, you have that one star over E1. So I want to show that E1 satisfies exactly the same conditions of the theorem. That is, uh, satisfies the inequality, doesn't have zeros on the upper half plane, is uh, value one at the origin, and uh, the real part of the i times the log divided by z is greater or equal than zero. Okay, so let me show the inequality part first. So this would be this times what? One minus z over w1 bar, one minus z over w1. So I want to show that this function here is less or equal than one, this function here on the left-hand side. So this would be this. This guy is less or equal than one than the upper half plane. And this is just something like O of model line of z, O of model line of z uh, through z in the upper half plane. So I can definitely apply fragment in the loch. In particular, the maximum of this function in the upper half plane would be the maximum at the real line. And on the real line, this is one. So the fragment Lindelof maximum pretty simple implies that E1 star is less or equal than E1. Okay, in the upper half plane. Great. Definitely doesn't have zeros because I'm cutting a zero in the lower half plane, uh, which is not on the upper half plane. Any questions here? Sorry. Yeah, I've got one, one small question. Yep. Um, when we show that the second part is, one, uh, is bounded by one, Yes. Can we just say that this is a Blaschke product and so we know that it's bounded by one? Because I mean, it's just a... What did this guy here say? Um, no, I mean on the other side, so where you applied the fragment Lindelof principle? Yeah, yeah, you could, but this is in the opposite direction. If it was uh, W1... Uh... Oh yeah, yeah, we should have, yes, okay. Am I writing this right? I think. I think yes. If you write, if you had a Blaschek product, this should be in the upper half plane. Yeah. yeah. And it's in the lower. Okay. This this is a similar trick when we show that the uh, when we showed what when we show that the function is in Poya class, we also had to remove some zeros, and in there we did a similar similar thing. Okay, so we still have that. That that this part here, this bit that I just did, is even part of the theorem uh, seven, because in there we had to remove zeros as well. Okay, uh, so that's part one. It still doesn't have zeros in the upper half plane, so I just have to show the other bit. And what's the other bit? Let me see how can we show that. Um, so we do know that. The real part of I we do know that this is represented by something which would they use C they use A, yes. A Y uh, C of T divided by T dt and this. Okay, great. Okay. But what's the other bit? The other bit we also know that, well, this function here, okay, is a function of Poya class because this guy is in the lower half plane. Okay, uh, this, this function here. Uh, and we just did the computation before to show the, uh, the the necessity case that this was greater or equal than zero, therefore is represented by uh, a Poisson integral, okay? And the, the A here has to be zero as we, as we saw before, because well, when we put IY here and send YY to infinity, uh, this thing is gonna go to zero anyway. So this has to be something like that for some measure, let's say sigma. But actually we can compute what the measure is 
because it has to be the real value of this thing on the real, uh, on the real line, okay? Uh, the real value of this whole thing. But this whole thing here is just EZ divided by E1. So this guy here has to be um, yes, phi t over t minus phi one t over t dt, where phi one is just the real part of i log of e one of t. Okay, this only defined when you have no zeros. I mean, what, I'm always writing like this, but the correct way of seeing it is it's as a limit going from the upper half plane. Okay because the log is defined there and then you have to take the limit. Anyway, so my argument was this has to have this representation because this has is greater equal than zero. So we just have to figure out the, the measure, but we know what it should be because by definition is of this form. And so it has to be this with phi one being this guy, okay? So that implies that the same formula holds for E1. Let's just make a difference. Okay. So we do have that. And now I want to show that phi one t over t is greater equal than zero. Okay, I don't know that yet. Okay, so let me show that. Uh, so first of all, since e1 is zero, is still one by definition, since we define it like this, and at the origin is still one, great. So that implies that phi one at zero is zero. Okay, great. And then we can compute since E one T bar divided by E one T equals E to two I phi T. Okay, you can compute the derivative on both sides and see what you get. And differentiating in both sides, you get that this is the real part of I E prime of t divided by e, but we know that this is another quantity as well. This is uh, the derivative in y of the log of e of x of t, sorry, t plus i y. So differentiate in y and put at y equals zero. Okay, this is another simple computation. We already did that in, in the the theorem about Poya class factor, uh, factorization of functions in Poya class. Anyway, uh, but then you observe the following by the condition that E of X, by the condition that uh, E of X minus IY is less or equal than E of X plus IY. If I differentiate the moduli, in y and evaluate at the origin, this condition here will imply that this is greater or equal than zero. Okay, so you have a function that comes from the right is greater than the function that comes from the left. Therefore, the derivative at the origin has to be greater or equal than zero. Okay, so therefore, this implies that phi one of t divided by t is always greater or equal than zero. Okay. So that implies that the real part of i log of e1 of z divided by z, since phi of t is greater or equal than zero, is greater or equal than zero. Okay. So great. I just verified that I can remove a zero and once I remove a zero, I still have the exact same properties. So then I can write this as this. I can remove several zeros. 
and EN will still satisfy the conditions. The conditions of the theorem. Okay. So then I, I want to show that this infinite product converges and the right way of doing that, we call that in Poya class, we had to multiply by something like an H um, um, a Z here, okay? But that, that won't change anything because whenever I take model I here, um, uh, this will depend only on X. And if I take the log, and if you recall, if you look to this condition here, whenever I have an exponential like this, so when I take the log, and we have like H times Z, so if I divide by Z, I will have only H times I. And if I take the real part, that will gonna be zero if H is real. So, if I multiply by e to h times z and h is a real number, I don't change any of the conditions. So the function still satisfy the conditions of the theorem. Okay. So that's what I'm gonna do. So, uh, so then what I wanna do is the following. So I know that a real part of the log so to take this infinite product here, to make it converge, we need some convergence condition on the zero. So I have to show some convergence condition, okay? And this is gonna be the convergence condition. So I know that this guy is greater than equal to zero. So if I do, sorry, if I do this thing for this product here, okay? I know that this bit here will satisfy the theorem but because we showed the, the necessity before. So the real part of I times log of this, all these terms divided by Z is always greater or equal than zero, greater than equal to zero, as well as this guy, because uh, we showed that by induction. Okay, so this is gonna be greater or equal than I throw away this bit. Let me write it as equal, then I throw away. Plus, and then do the rest, which would be a sum. Okay, but then I can just throw away this term here because it's greater or equal than zero and just say that this is greater or equal than the sum. Okay. And, but the real part of uh, that, yes, we can do this, great, yes. Then if I evaluate as z equals i, That's, so I'm gonna put I here, so the I's will cancel. You have just real part of the log, which is just uh, the log of the model I. Okay. And since this is entire function, the zeros can't accumulate under uh, the complex bank, they're exploding to infinity. So then you can compare this log with some simple inequalities just as I did before with one, one, one had a sum of the log logs like this. So then you can show that the real part of I log of V of Z divided by Z is gonna be greater or equal than uh, say um, the sum of the J equals some constant C equals one to N of just what the brands is right which is exactly the condition for Poya class. J squared, copy bar, and this would be J. Okay, and this would only work if WJ 
let's say is greater or equal than some big R, let's say. But you only have finitely many of these guys, which is less than R. And um, yes, yeah, so you only have like finitely many of these guys, which are less or equal than R. Uh, and this guy is full, the sum will converge anyway for this guy. So we only need something like that. Okay. So that will show that, so this would imply, so this by theorem seven, that this product here will converge. That HJ numbers are equal to, the, to these guys here. This converges and it's a function of Poya class, okay? But then E equals, then E will be equal to a certain limit when N goes to infinity of EN of Z, E to minus Z, and here the sum of the real positive limits to N times this function here. Let me call this function F for instance, times F. And that limit has to converge because the limit of that converges and F is just one divided by these guys here. So this has to converge, whatever it is, it has to converge. Let me call this guy um, G, not G, let's say H. Okay. Now H has no zeros. Uh, H of zero is one, okay. Uh, we did know that EN satisfies the conditions of the theorem. So it satisfies the inequality in the upper half plane. For instance, the inequality EN star is less or equal than EN on the upper half plane, okay. But then as I mentioned, if I just multiply by an exponential times some real number, it doesn't change this, this uh, inequality. So we still have that E n star is less or equal to H n star is less or equal to H in C plus. And also this condition here was still hold because we do know that for each uh, um, A n, the real part E n, the real part of this was greater or equal than zero, okay? But the real part of this guy, but if you do for the same function here, I mean, I should call this function not h, call this whole thing here, h. the limit and go on h. And for each term here, you just have en, which satisfies the thing times this. But again, if you do this thing for that function here, you're just going to have the, the real part of i times this number, which is zero because this number, this number is real. So that doesn't change anything as well. So we still have that this thing is greater or equal to zero. So therefore, uh, by but what we did, we did first, this has to be A greater equal than zero, real part of B greater equal than zero, okay? But this is of Poya class, okay? And F was of Poya class and products of functions in Poya class is in Poya class. And that finishes the proof. Okay, any questions here in this last proof? Okay, so as I said, uh, this proves uh, uh, these uh, arguments in Brun's book, they're very sharp. It's hard to, to try to come out uh, in a tangent or try to simplify something because they are very well structured. So. So sometimes it can get a bit annoying or even like tedious to follow every single part because there is no other way basically. But anyway, that finishes chapter one, which was all the prerequisites we had. 
in next uh, class, we will talk about Pele-Venus spaces. And maybe even the other class, we'll do some applications of Pele-Venus spaces, just some things in longer theory. Hopefully, it will work this out. But anyway, you have any questions, comments before we finish? Okay, so thank you and see you next time.